Welcome to this House of Books. Today, we're helping to launch a new book by one of our member authors. Thank you for joining us. Well, welcome to this House of Books. We have a, a book launch today. It's a, a, an exciting event for us. We're launching uh, a book by uh, Precious McKenzie. It's, uh, it's called Ruffian. And we have with us also a uh, special guest. We have Luana, who's a publisher uh, at B. Lou. So I, you know, I think I'm just going to get out of your way and, and let the two of you visit a little bit. Why don't you go ahead and uh, take, it, take it away. All right. Um, thank you for being here, everyone. This is really exciting. Um, uh, and thank you, Luana, for being here too as well. And Mark, thank you for hosting. And Rosanna uh, for managing our sound <laughs> and our tech. Thank you. Um, I think they turned off all the cameras for right now. But if you have questions, you can type them in the chat. And then I think when we're done talking, we can unmute you or take questions too. Um, and I think we have some door prizes for you too at the end. So, um, yeah. Wow. I, I can't believe we're actually here, Luana. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's been a long time coming, but so exciting. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, I, I think I've been working on this book for about three years. And um, it started as a picture book idea when I was working on my master's in fine arts. And I, I wrote it as a biography of the horse. And I um, sent it to my professor as a picture book biography. And you, and you all know how Ruffian's story ends, unfortunately. Um, and my professor, um, in all of her wisdom, said, I really don't think this should be a picture book for children unless you want to traumatize little children. <laughs> and um, she was exactly right. <laughs> um, and then she said, you, you might want to make this into a novel. And I was kind of afraid because I didn't think I could write a novel. It was the, just the thought of writing a novel terrified me. Uh, but she kind of got me started and helped me with structure and voice. And then I worked on it for the last two years of um, the master's program. And it was my master's thesis, my creative thesis. And when I met with Luana, I was telling her what I was working on. and her eyes lit up and I knew I found a kindred spirit <laughs> who believed in the story too. <laughs> yeah, from when she started telling me about it, I was like, I hope I get to publish this book. I have, it's, it's such an uh, interesting story, the story of Ruffian. And then um, the way Precious uh, wrapped in um, Meg's story in with it, it just really is such a great, um, historical fiction for kids and you know I mean sometimes us as adults think as historical fiction as way long ago but for kids this is historical <laughs> so um, so yeah it's such a great um, mesh between the story of Meg and the story of Ruffian. No. Thank you um, and, and that was kind of the challenge too is to do the historical research because um, she passed away in 1975. So I had to go through archives and, and learn about what life was like in the 70s because I was just a baby at that time. So <laughs> I had hit the archives. Bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know there's younger people in the audience. So, <laughs> um, so I, I mean, the, it was a lot of fun digging through these archives. Um, Keeneland Racing was wonderful. They have tremendous archives on the thoroughbred horse industry. And I contacted their research librarians and I said, I'm working on this book project about Ruffian. Can you send me any articles or information you have about her? And a couple of weeks later, I get this huge package in the mail, just photocopies of articles about her life and her career and the people who worked with her. Um, so I am eternally grateful for their librarians. Mm -hmm. I mean, this project wouldn't have been possible without, without them. Um, so, you know, I, I did that for the first part of it. And then I had to also figure out what life would have been like, what 
homes would have looked like and fashion looked like and the food of the 1970s. So I went into um, Rocky Mountain College's archives and, you know, you can get just about anything on interlibrary loan. And it's <laughs> an amazing <laughs> treasure trove of, of riches. And I requested um, a full year's worth of Better Homes and Gardens magazines from 1972 to 73. And they sent me this huge um, hardbound book of like 13 months of Better Homes and Gardens. So I just read <laughs> all of those old issues of Better Homes and Gardens. And I took notes on the recipes that people were making in the early 70s, uh, the types of clothes that were featured in those advertisements, um, what, the, what the homes were fashionably decorated as and the color schemes that they used. So I could recreate the, the 1970s in this book. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, jello molds were a really big thing back in the early 70s. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll make a comeback. <laughs> um, Mark says no, he's shaking his head. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to really immerse myself in, in that research. And then the real challenge, I think, was that I wanted to stay true to Ruffian's story and honor all the people that worked with her and that cared for her um, because they're just remarkable people and rem remarkable teams. But then I also wanted to pull in an angle that would really um, attract kids and speak to kids. And I didn't think they wanted to hear a story told from adults' point of view. So that's why I invented Meg Murphy and her family, her aunt and her uncle and her mom and her dad, her little sister, you know, those are just figments of my imagination. <laughs> they never really worked with Ruffian. <laughs> as far as I know, there was no one involved in her life like that family, but I needed to get that kid angle in there uh, so that readers could identify with someone, of, someone close to their age. So, yeah. And, and that's one thing that I think is so powerful in the book and it's because it is told through Meg's eyes. So, you know, and kids have that connection with animals often and especially horses, that's a, you know, a big thing. And, and that's Precious's um, background. I mean, she definitely was a horse kid when she was little, she's still a horse person. And, um, and I think that the combination of her uh, attention to detail in the research is phenomenal. Um, and um, I think that partly comes from her background in writing uh, nonfiction so much because she's done that a lot. And then her story with um, Meg, it's like she captured, you know, the essence of, you know, being in a horse barn and you can hear the horses and you can, you know, you get the whole sense and that's her background of being so familiar with horses. Um, and, and I think that all comes together so powerfully. And um, one thing that I really like about Meg in this book is that it isn't, there isn't any like romance in the book for Meg. And, and I just think it's so good. I think it's so great that we have a book that is, you know, a teenage girl and it isn't about a boy girl relationship. Although there is her little uh, irritations with her cousin, but that is family related and not, you know, boy, girl. And, and I think that's really powerful in the book too. Um, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think like when I created Meg, um, like Luana said, I mean, I've always been a horse kid um, and my parents can attest to that. They're on today. Hi. <laughs> um, you know, I was the kid that collected briar horses and, you know, love those storybooks about horses and horse people and model horses. And um, so this is very much a story from my heart. I mean, this is and the characters in this book, um, especially Meg, I think I think of her as like the she's she's just represents all of the best horse people that i've ever met and that i've had the chance to work with you know those people that just work ty tirelessly for um these wonderful creatures um, and love them you know so it's like my tribute to them um 
you know, from the farriers to the trainers, to the owners, um, to the veterinarians, you know, it's just the incredible dedication and love people have for, for horses I wanted to put into this book. So. Yeah. And, and it definitely comes through in the book. Um, I wasn't, I was around horses growing up, but I was not as much of a horse kid. And because um, I had a few um, not great run-ins with horses too. <laughs> but, um, but I think that too, the Precious's passion, and even though she wrote about a child that was similar to her, I was always impressed in the book that I didn't feel like I was reading Precious. Meg was her own person. She wasn't Precious. Precious wasn't all over the character. And they were, they're two distinct per people. And I think that's really hard sometimes when you're writing something that's very close to you and it's experiences that you've had, you know, it, it can be challenging to separate you from the character. And I think you did that really well. Not that you're not a great person and that you, you aren't one of the best horse people I know, but um, I thought that was, it's just really important in a book to um, be able to do that. So I think that kind of speaks to your, um, your hard work and also your ability as a writer, so. Thank you. Um, you know, and Luana knows, I mean, it's, it's not like you sit down and you write a novel in a, in a tower all by yourself. <laughs> um, there are so many people along the way giving help and um, just gentle encouragement or really solid criticism to help make the story the best that it can be. It kind of pushed you a little bit too as a writer, as an artist. Um, so I had wonderful critique groups at Spalding University, wonderful critique groups here in Billings that I'm a part of. Um, Luana's comments, of course, <laughs> I mean, she's like razor sharp focus <laughs> to help me out. Um, and then such wonderful mentors and professors in the program that really helped refine the voice and the style um, to make it to make it shine. So I mean, it's, it's just incredible. And then I think Luana, we we hit the jackpot with the design. <laughs> um, I'll show you my, this is the advanced reader copy that I had marked up before we sent in our final proofs. Um, but the cover was painted by Henry Blonde, a painter here in Montana. And then Tara Ramo designed the cover and she designed the interior and all of the wonderful historical elements, the educational elements, the back Tara also designed too. So really just, a beautiful, beautiful book. It was, yeah, it was yeah. like Christmas when I got the copy in the mail. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was wonderful. And it's Christmas right now where I'm at because I, you can't see them, but behind me is a whole stack of ruffian books. So <laughs> the boxes have arrived, and that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, but um, and to that point too, I think it's really important for us to um, highlight that it isn't just the story. I think we worked hard to give the, so kids, when they read the story, when they get to the end, there's an actual picture of Ruffian. There's a picture of Ruffian's grave. Um, and then there's all of the research information and there's some glossary type things. So um, it, it helps kids really know that the story is real and that um, it can it, and it will help launch them maybe into looking for more information and researching things themselves so um, and maybe they don't feel like they're a story writer but they're really passionate about something you know that's nonfiction, and it might help them see that that's a way they can bring the two together so I just think it, that's a really Signing books and it's what we do. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and I know, like there, were, there are some parts of the thoroughbred horse racing industry that I, I didn't know anything about because I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of horse racing, but you know, there are a lot of technical details that. I'm just clueless about. Um, but luckily, where I teach, we have an equestrian program, and I think a couple of them might be on here now today. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but 
I mean, I use their professors as like little resources and I would randomly ask them strange questions about the horse industry. <laughs> so I acknowledged them in the book too, gave them a little shout out um, because th there's just so much information, but I wanted to make it accessible for kids. You know, like what would a kid need to know? What's just enough? What's not gonna bore them or overwhelm them, but what's just enough to get the point across. So, um, you know, it's always that fine, fine balance to kind of know what your readers, what kind of support your readers are going to need, you know? Yeah. So, um, do you want me to read a couple of pages? Yeah. Okay. So from Ruffian, again, beautiful cover. <laughs> um, this is chapter five. So it's a little ways into the book, but this is where Meg, our main character, where she meets um, Ruffian for the very first time. And this is chapter five, set in Claiborne Farm, Paris, Kentucky, April 17th, 1972, 9.42ish PM. Feel for the front legs, Doc said, help her out. Meg wrapped her fingers around the slick sack and felt around for the foal's hooves. Got him, Meg squatted back on her haunches. Pull, Doc said, but pull slow and steady and stop when I say stop. Meg watched the mare's breathing and saw her side heave, a contraction. Now pull, Meg pulled. Wait, Doc whispered. Doc's hands were on the mare's face. The mare, shenanigans, was sweaty and lying on her side. The birth of this foal was taking longer than usual. The mare took another breath. Doc could see her muscles rippling in contractions like waves crossing the ocean. Pull now, Doc ordered. Meg hunkered down on her legs, leaned back, and tugged the foal's wet legs with all her might. Stop. Meg stopped. The mare's side heaved again with a contraction. Now pull. She pulled the foal's front legs. More of its body slid from its mother. Stop. Meg's arms and back ached. The pungent smell of bodily fluids and alfalfa hay caught in her nose and throat. She felt queasy, on the verge of passing out. She tried to bury her face in her shoulder to block the smell, to stop her gag reflex. You okay? Meg swallowed hard. Yes, sir. Her skin felt cold and clammy. Hang in there. A few more contractions and the baby will be out. The mare heaved again and Doc said pull. As Meg pulled, the foal slid a little further from its mother's body. The sack around the foal broke. She caught sight of a black nose and long front legs. Add a girl, Maggie, you've almost got him out, Doc said proudly. Five more pulls and stops and they had the foal halfway out of the mare. Then in one wet gush of fluid and flesh, a jet black foal slipped from the mare's body. Meg landed on her rear end in the soft hay. She gazed at the foal's spindly legs and its large dark face. Its ears were pinned back, then twitched forward. Alive. Thank God it is alive. Meg wanted to shout from the rafters or cry. She didn't know which. She had never been so bone tired before or so happy. The baby was the most beautiful creature she'd ever seen. All wobbly innocence and charm as if good things were possible. It was strange, this feeling of hopefulness. So there's that's when she first meets the baby that would go on to become Ruffy and the racehorse. But of course that's all fictional <laughs> because Meg doesn't exist. <laughs> but that was Ruffy and actual birth date, so. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that just, it's that's, that's such a good section of the, a, a great little part to read because it gives you the feeling for Meg, but it also gives you the feeling for how well the description in the story is and um, without being too much for kids, you know, like it just walks that nice line that it gives them enough of a feeling without, um, you know, taking them over to where you, you know, where they don't want to go and you don't really want to take them. So um, I think that's such a, because there's a lot of intense emotions in the book. So um, it's important to be able to find that line for kids. So, yeah. and on that point, um, you know, we really work 
uh, hard when we make books for kids and try to think of it from all angles. And I knew when I'm reading the story, I knew the ending for Ruffian. And, you know, so as I'm reading, I'm like crying along thinking that I know, I know what's going to happen to Ruffian and, 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 um, and I pretty much cry at anything. So, so I'm, and, and I'm reading, anticipating that and just wondering how Precious is going to end it. Cause I didn't want the reader to just end right at the moment when Ruffian died. I thought that would be really hard for kids, but I also didn't want it to be glossed over or wrapped up in a neat little bow and here's your package and everything's happy and you know rainbows again and everything's good and um, I'm not going to tell you what the ending is but she she does an amazing job taking you from being so sad I mean and just I mean like crying I mean it's like you better have a box of tissues and to a place where it's okay and you know and and Meg is okay again and um but it's done so well and it's not um fluff it's just life carrying on and how you pick up and carry on from when bad things happen or hard things happen and I think that in a way that's kind of a store a lesson in the book for Meg and for everyone so Thank you. <laughs> um, whoops, I'm getting a message from our Zoom here. <laughs> I just had to click the button. We were running out of time. Um, yeah, that was, it was really hard to um, write the ending for kids, you know, um, because I'd watched the footage of the, the Her Last Race over and over again. Um, because it needed to be told, you know, it needed to be, it couldn't be ignored. Um, it couldn't be swept under the rug. It needed to be told. Um, but then I really tried to get into the head of this young girl who just witnessed probably the most horrific thing she could have ever seen, right? Um, so, and the question as I was writing those last chapters was how, how could you go on? How would a person go on after witnessing? this you know so um and my first not to give away the ending or anything but my first reactions it would be her family the family would have to come together the community her horse her horse community would have to come together because they would all be traumatized and heartbroken so how how do you go on after this you know so i just kind of try to stay into that zone and and proceed with love you know yeah through it all yeah yeah. Precious, I'm, I'm just thinking, um, uh, developing a relationship with a horse is special. It's, um, you know, with a dog, it's, you know, and it happens very quickly and almost automatically. Dogs bond, you know, fast. But horses, um, for horses, it's different. Can you Put your finger on what makes the relationship with a horse special. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. Some people say that they're like uh, two thousand pound toddlers, <laughs> which I think to some extent they definitely are <laughs> because of things they try. Um, but I think I don't know. There's something I think a lot of them either like you right away or they don't. And they're all different, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I'm remembering uh, one of my one of my favorite Montana artists, uh, Deborah Butterfield's done a lot of horse sculptures, and she talked about. Uh, I think she really got horses, but I think she talked about how um, horses don't automatically bond. That you really have to win them over to you. It's it's different than any other animal that maybe we have a close relationship with oh yeah i i completely agree yeah yeah and yeah. they they know right away you you have to work to show them <laughs> that you're good enough to be in their company <laughs> <laughs> right yeah i had another question too about um you 
you wrote this as as a part of your MFA program, but you already have a PhD, and I'm wondering why did you why did you need to go back to school to get an MFA? <laughs> What's the difference there? That was a really good question, um, and that was a question that I struggled with um, as I was making the decision to start the MFA because I was teaching, had the PhD, and I was writing on the side, but I wanted to kind of push myself a little bit and learn more about the craft, go deeper into the craft of creative writing, because uh, my PhD is in literature, so it's a kind of different perspective, but I felt like there was a lot I still wanted to learn, you know, I, and, you know, I talked this over with my family, you know, because it would be a major time commitment. I mean, we're talking like, it would be like taking on another part-time job or something, uh, like 20, 25 hours a week. And, you know, it's like, does this make sense? And it was like making lists of pros and cons, pros and cons. And then finally, I remembered what my parents have always said. They're like, you know, education is never a bad thing. It's never bad to get more educated, you know, and I thought that that's the answer. So I, I applied and, and got into the MFA program and spent about three years um, really immersing myself in the study of creative writing as a craft, but really specifically writing uh, for kids and developing that voice and mm -hmm. the point of view for writing for kids. So, and I met so many wonderful people and really had quite a few strong projects come out of that journey that I think it was probably one of the best decisions I've ever made. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking you have so many books out as it is. I mean, you're within the people associated with the bookstore, you were probably the most prolific, well, you are the most prolific author that we have. And I, I'm thinking, I don't know how many, you and I sat down and tried to count the number of titles that you published, uh, uh, mostly nonfiction and mostly oriented toward kids. But this is the first novel, so yeah. it's quite interesting. Yeah. And Luana was there for a lot of the earlier ones that I did because she served yes. as my editor um, for all of those years at work. Um, yeah. Oh, for, okay. for many, many of those titles, she was my editor. <laughs> okay. Well, and, and, you know, Precious also edited many, many, many books along the way. But I, I think that she, I'm glad you brought that question up, Mark, about why she got the MFA. And I think that that just captures something about Precious and great writers is that they're always working on their craft. They're always pushing themselves they're always looking for a new challenge and um and and for people who want to be writers i think you have to really think about that you know and and her taking that mfa you know not all writers like to be edited <laughs> i'm an editor i can speak to that but and um and so the MFA, you know, that's even, you know, that's an editor on, you know, 10 times, you know, I mean, like, that's like really intense. And so I think that that speaks to Precious's dedication and commitment. And, um, but it also is a great lesson for want to be writers and, you know, or want to be published writers because you're writers, but you might not be published yet is it's a lot of work and you've got to keep at it and you have to be open to comments and criticisms and um but find your community too find your tribe that's you know going to push you but support you too so yeah ab absolutely as Luana said I mean I think the more people you surround yourself with who are willing to give you constructive criticism on your work, the better your writing will be. And I'll get it ready for publication. Yeah, find, find your tribe. <laughs>